Creator Talk Live. I'm Brian Thomas Schmidt. I'm an author and editor of 22 anthologies, seven of which are number one bestsellers. I have written seven novels. My latest is Shortcut. If you want to know about it, you can check the link at the top of my profile and click the first tab once that opens there. We also have these live shows that we're doing every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and occasionally Tuesday and Thursday with the best authors, artists, and musicians on the, in, well, on TikTok and elsewhere. I'm bringing them all in. Uh, tonight's guest is D.D. Black. He is a mystery author and uh, a, a very successful independent uh, author. And uh, we're going to talk to him all about writing for the next hour or so. You can see these replays. They will be available in the third tab on that same uh, Beacon, Beacon AI link that you click on my profile. Uh, they're playing on YouTube. I just put them together, throw the logo on the front and the back, and, and put them up there. So you can always watch them later, but hopefully you'll stick with us tonight. Please follow our creator tonight, and please like the chat so more people come. Anyway, all that said, DD, welcome. Now that you finally got in here, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, and I apologize for the, the trouble. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, are you able to see my video now? It seems to think I'm showing a video. Well, I invited you again to do it. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Try it. Turn it off and turn it back on. Okay. Oops. There you are. There you are. Okay, great. Hey there. Yeah, hey. so you can tell I'm old because I tried to do this on my desktop. And so that's why it wasn't showing your invitations because it was saying this message type not supported. Oh, this is why I that's for writing and leave on. the technology to other people. So now are you on your phone? Because you're sideways. Yes, I'm on my phone here. I can I can flip it though. That's good. There we go. That'll that'll just be a little bit less awkward. There we go, bud. Well, good to see you. Good to see you. I'm glad we finally got this together. Um, so basically, uh, we're just going to talk about writing. So tell us, I mean, tell us a little bit about how did you get into writing? What what brought you to, made you want to write books? So I'm from a journalism background. Here, let me just get this set up here because I was expecting to do this on my desktop where I have a whole nice setup. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Sorry about that. No, that's right. I didn't know that this wouldn't work on a desktop. So uh, I came from a journalism background. Uh, I taught journalism. I wrote for some newspapers, and I always knew that I wanted to write fiction. Um, and I kind of did that off and on until my early 30s when I got serious about writing fiction for a living. And that time I was teaching English and just started writing my first novel and kept going from there and started doing it full time about seven years ago. And um, then really in the last year, it started going really well. But, you know, it's a lot of work to transition from writing journalism to writing fiction. It's a lot of different yes. journalistic yeah. things and a lot of bad journalism habits I had to get out of to write fiction. They, they were good <laughs> habits in journalism, but they didn't work as well in fiction, like writing it's for true. I, for example. It's true. That was my background, too. So I get it. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So, um, so you write mystery. What made you want to write mystery? I think it's just because I grew up watching mystery shows with my mom and listening to mystery books on tape and reading mysteries. Um, I've always been interested in crime and kind of the the real world, um, although I'm working on a fantasy project too now, so I think I'm less and less interested in the quote unquote real world. Um, but uh, it's just it's just what came naturally to me when I started writing and also, you know, I wanted to make a living at this. So I thought, I, I know there's a big market for mystery novels and I'll have fun sure. writing it. So. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So how many books, how many books have you put out? You, you've been doing it kind of full time. Well, seven years, you said full time. And how many books do you have out? I have about 30 total. Uh, I used to write thrillers wow. under a different pen name, AC Fuller. And about a year ago, a little year and a half, maybe I started this DD Black pen name, which is for mysteries. And uh, I've been focusing on that ever since. And under that name, I have seven, eight books out now, eight books. Gotcha. So what are your, are you writing a series, are they standalones or are you writing a series character? Oops. A big series and um, I will be at some point soon launching another series, which I haven't yet formally announced, but has been in, in the works for quite a while. So what's the name of your, your, your series character? Uh, Thomas Austin is a uh, retired NYPD detective who moves to the Pacific Northwest and um, ends up working as a consultant for the Kitsap Sheriff's Department near Seattle. Gotcha. Now, is that where you're based? I mean, what made you decide to set it there? 
Yeah, um, I'm based in a little town called Hansville, which is where he lives in the books. And uh, I said it there basically because I'm lazy and I didn't want to have to do too much research. Yeah, because <laughs> you can do it every day. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Whoa, the, the world is spinning. Sorry. <laughs> set this up. Hold on one second here. It's, yeah, no problem. I'm to set this phone up so I can charge it while uh, it is. Okay. That's decent, right? Yep, that's fine. No, it fell. It fell. It's okay. See, he's a man of mystery. You never know which angle he's going to be looking at you from. <laughs> like I said, this I'm, I just had a meeting with the assistant that I'm hiring, and I found someone 15 years younger than me, and hopefully she will understand how TikTok works. So next time... <laughs> Next time she'll be able to set it up for me, and I won't, I won't blow it again. But I no, appreciate no, your patience no, with me. It's no problem, brother. Um, we've had all kinds of technical problems getting things going, so it's just yeah. we just uh, the audience has learned to roll with it. So yeah, it's good. good. Um, so you're you wrote an NYPD inspector. Um, how much research did you have to do to kind of pull that off? Obviously, the laws are different where you are. The laws are different there. The laws in New York. I mean, there's some similarities, but there are some differences. Also, the differences between how a consultant might work and and an actual, you know, officer yeah. of the law. Yeah, it's pretty different. Um, I did a fair amount of research. Also, mine aren't super technical procedural mysteries. Some some people are writing really true to life procedural type mysteries from within a police department. Mine are a little more on the thriller side, where. I take a few more liberties and kind of gloss over some of the stuff a little bit. So they're not just all made up, but I don't go into as much detail as some some books might into the procedural stuff. So um, in terms of, I wanted to make him a consultant because that way he could work with the police sometimes and then work as a private investigator other times. So there could be books that were within the police department and books outside the police department. So that's why I did that. and. Um, it wasn't too much too much difference. I mean, whenever I look up law stuff, it's always applicable to Washington State since that's where they're operating. Mm -hmm. But um, book seven in the series was based in New York City, so I had to look up a few things for New York City. He went back home in that book, so I did have to look yeah. up some stuff. I gotcha. Well, so what? How are all seven books that you have out as D D Black based on on this character, or do you have yeah. more? Yeah, it's just a oh. series with this character and um. People seem to be enjoying it, and so I'm going to be doing quite a few more, it looks like, in this series. Well, are they standalones, or uh, do, is there a through line? Uh, they do work as standalones. Each one works as a standalone mystery, but there are some character-level through lines, so the yes. character relationships do develop. So if you pick up book five, it'll make sense, but most people are reading them in order because they want to see how the relationships are developing. And also the, the main character... Um, has his wife was murdered back in New York City, and so he is finding tidbits about that crime for the first seven books in the gotcha. series. And then, so what's the first book called? The first book is called The Bones at Point No Point. Uh, Point No Point is a beach uh, and a little park with a lighthouse quite near my house, and uh, that's book one in the series. And yeah, it's currently either, either the number one or number two mystery on Amazon right now and has been for quite a while. So people are really liking this one. Um, kind of to my well, shock, you know, after you write a lot of books and most of them don't do that well, it's, right. it's a little bit of a shock when suddenly something really takes off. And how many are, how, are now, are these available in hardcover and, and, and audio and paperback and, and ebook? I mean, what is the format that you can get them? Yeah. All of the above, yeah. Okay. All of the well, above. definitely bring, brother, bring me a hardcover next week and I'll, I'll buy one from you at Rave. Okay. Definitely want to check it out. Okay. I actually may not have any hardcover. Oh, and I, think oh okay. I, I see some. Yeah, I, I move. I sell so few hardcovers. Most people like the paperbacks around here, so I don't. I, I actually do have some, but I will. I'll bring some, and uh, yeah. yeah so I'm a hardcover yeah. guy. So yeah, I definitely want. We're what I'm talking about is we're going to be in Vegas together at a convention called Twenty Books. A whole bunch of like, th and there will be 300 uh, indie authors, including. D.D. Black, myself, Jonathan Mayberry, Kevin G. Anderson, Craig Martell, and uh, a whole bunch of people from all different genres. Yeah. There's a romance. There's everything. We're all going to be signing. It'll be a week from Friday from 10 in the morning to 4 p.m. It's free, and you just come to the Horseshoe Casino and, and, and ask them where the rave is, and they'll, they'll send you back in the convention center, and that's where we are. And so you can come get books signed. And... 
there's book signings, there's giveaways, there's no pressure to buy anything, but you can get a lot of stuff for free there. I think, aren't yeah. they getting like Kindle Unlimited subscriptions and all sorts of stuff. There's usually readings, you know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Good morning, Rufa, I see you, hi. Yeah, exactly, there's a whole, there's lots of really cool stuff and most people give you, most people have a little, um, I'm putting mine together now, a little code, you, what are those called, the QR code that you can scan and you'll get a free, like a, a free book that leads into their series that you can see, or even the first book of the series on ebook, things like that. So there's gonna be lots of cool things. Jonathan Mayberry and I are gonna debut our new anthology that has a lot of cool stories of Joe Ledger, including a story from Wayne Brady of all people. And so there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff. So yeah, come and come and check it out. And I'm sure you can get both the the AC Fuller and the DD Black books there and and check out what uh, what he's doing. So um, hey, TikTok famous. So anyway, uh, so the whole the whole craft of mysteries and things. You you've been reading them your whole life. Did did you have to do any particular work uh, on switching between the mystery thriller thing? Or you said a lot of your mysteries are kind of thrillers anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, with the new ones, I follow a pretty strict mystery structure, you know, so they're, why I call these mysteries and those were thrillers is um, these stick to the mis the classic mystery formula a little bit more where you almost always find a body or some evidence of a crime in chapter one, and then you get, you know, the investigators involved in chapter two, and they kind of methodically go through and solve it. Um, so I would, I would say these are more traditional mysteries. They verge on thriller and there's a little bit more action in these sometimes. Um, they're not like uh, super low stakes. They're, they're pretty dark. The crimes are fairly gruesome. There's a lot of jeopardy. Yeah, they're, not cozy. they're definitely not cozies. Yeah. They're definitely not cozies. And if you go read the blurb of the first book and you find out that the villain, the press has nicknamed her the holiday baby butcher, uh, usually that's enough to turn people off if they aren't into that. <laughs> Into you know it's it's not it's not graphic it's not gruesome but the crime is fairly horrific it's it's the worst thing I could think of to put in a book honestly in terms of the crime so no the crimes are fairly dark but the main characters are fairly likable it's not it's not a sort of a you know drunken abusive detective kind of guy it's uh, more people you'd want to hang out with uh, although the villains are are fairly fairly horrible. But yeah, I did well, a lot of research on the mystery genre. In addition to reading it, I kind of structured it out to figure out how I wanted these to be paced and how I wanted them to flow and and to make them as, as fast paced as possible without losing depth and really make them entertaining for the readers. I get it. And you're dealing with murder after all. So it isn't a pretty business no matter how you look at it. No, it's not. I mean, I, I, I think because of my journalism background, I I want to reflect the real world as much as possible. And so, um, you know, there's some pretty horrific crimes in the world. It turns out uh, people ask, how did I come up with the crime in the first book? Because it's so horrific. And I, I, had, I actually had Googled a list of the most uh, horrific serial killers in history and read the list and actually took one of the killers and changed a bunch of details and toned it down a lot for the book. Um, so it is loosely based on a real uh, British um, case from the sixties and seventies. Gotcha. Well, yeah. I mean, and and uh, and you know, I love those dark, gritty thrillers. That's my that's my wheelhouse. That's it's what I it's what I tend to write. I write thrillers, but some of mine have a mix of science fiction in them. But I'm I'm writing my first straight thriller, and it's it's a straight kind of a it's a PI story. It's a noir, and so it doesn't the the body doesn't the body shows up, but not. Well, the bodies are, it's a, it's a long story. He has to go to a different country to investigate. So anyway, the point is, <laughs> he knows about the murder early, but it's kind of a more of a thriller set up, surprise story kind of thing. But anyway, yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you, you deal with all this, as, obviously as a journalist, you know a lot about um, investigating things. So that helps you. But what about the forensics and those kind of things? How do you get into all that besides watching CSI, obviously? Yeah. Um... Usually, I pawn that off on side characters. Um, my theory with this, I wanted to make the, there is a murder mystery in each one, but I wanted to make the relationships a little bit more central and the character drama a little bit more central. So as much as possible, I summarize that via a conversation with a side character, rather than having my main character, who's not a forensics expert, spend a lot of time on that. So he'll have a moment or two of um, 
you know, very intelligent work, but I try to get the details into the smallest package I can yeah. and then move on to things that I think are a little more relatable to people, which is stuff like motive and relationships and um, kind of the, the philosophical existential stuff. Sure. So I, I mostly wave at the uh, intricate details of police work and indicate that the characters are taking it into consideration without putting a ton of it on the page. Gotcha. I never thought that wasn't really a decision. That's just kind of what I ended up doing. And it seemed to have resonated with, with a lot of readers who don't typically read a lot of mysteries. Um, I think it's just enough of it. I, I hope it's enough of it, but it's always a tough call. I don't know. I never know how much to put of that sort of stuff. Well, obviously the books are doing well, so it can't be, you can't be doing it wrong. I mean, well, yeah. you know. I mean, pe people are liking them, um, but it always is a balance. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, I could have gone into more detail or, or do a little a little less glossing over some of the police work details, but I don't know. It seems to be working well, and I'm just rolling with it. I hear you. Well, good for you. Um, and so tell us about, I mean, all right, when you went into this, you obviously started with thrillers and stuff. What, how'd you end up going indie as opposed to going with uh, trying to go? Did you try with a traditional publisher? What was your what was your route to publication? Yeah, so my first uh, book, The Anonymous Source, was published by a small a Seattle press in 2015, just a very, very small one. They went bankrupt a year later, right when the sequel was about to come out. So I got the rights back, and by then I had learned a fair amount about indie and was going to go that route. So I, I was in the 20 books group uh, back when it first started, when there was maybe 100 or 200 people in it in 2016-ish, I found that group. And then I thought, oh, I better just stick with indie. So I, I went indie and um, I did sign with a literary agent about three or four years ago. Um, and I tried to go the traditional route for a while while sticking indie with some books. We almost sold a book to a big publisher and didn't end up selling. And then she wanted me to write more literary crime and I wanted to write a big indie series. So we split up and the rest is history. That was about 18 months ago. And ever since things have really taken off. Uh, it's just a different, you know, the traditional route was too slow for me. Um, too many unknowns and lack of control wasn't really my thing. Well, and how long does it take you to write a book? Obviously you put out seven books or in this series. Uh, do you do a book a year? It sounds, or I mean, seven years you've been, you've got 30 books out. So you obviously don't, you do more than a book a year. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, I can write a fast paced 60,000 word mystery in about a month now. Um, and, but the book I wrote for my agent took over a year because there's a lot of back and forth. It was a longer book, way more complicated. And I've got a fantasy series I've been working on for four years. That's 800 pages and that's not even done. So it kind of depends on the book. 800 I mean, pages is the first book. First book is 800 pages and it's not yeah. done and yeah. it's not out. And I don't know when or if it'll ever be out. So <laughs> I've got a lot of world building and some maps and a nice fantasy language and all sorts of stuff. But um, so it really depends on the project, but you know, a gun to my head, I can write a, a, a mystery novel in a few weeks or a month. Um, if it's characters I already know, and it's not very long, and it's fast paced, and things like that. Gotcha. gotcha. So it's 60, 60 to 70,000 about the range of most of these books in this series? Yeah, they're all uh, between, I think, 57 and 68. So they're all yeah. fairly short, um, quite fast paced, a lot of action in them. And they're fun. So, They're fun. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so when it came to learning the whole indie thing, you you obviously had to obviously you had help with twenty books. But how do you? Yeah. What's your? What is your? You know, obviously, okay. For those who don't know what the indie thing is, although a lot of people on TikTok do, obviously you do all your own marketing. You you have to find somebody to do all your editing, your cover design, your layout, all that. How much of that do you do? How much of it do you farm out? And how did you figure out what to do and who to work with? Yeah, so at the beginning, I mean, I definitely hung around this uh, 20 books to 50K Facebook group uh, quite a bit and found editors through there uh, for formatting. I found out about a program called Vellum, which is what I use for formatting. Um, I found proofreaders through there. I found cover designers through there and through other Facebook groups, just kind of networking with people and getting advice uh, made a lot of mistakes along the way, a lot of covers that didn't really work for marketing purposes, but I may have enjoyed the cover, but it wasn't a good choice for marketing. 
Um, you know, I probably wasted a lot of time on marketing efforts that weren't really a good use of my time for selling books, kind of learned the hard way on some things. Um, and then, you know, about a year and a half ago when my fantasy series kind of realized I couldn't quite finish it and I decided I wanted to write kind of a big mainstream mystery series. Uh, that's when I really got more into learning about Facebook ads and other forms of ads that authors use. And, and that combined with this series is really why it's taken off. Um, it's getting a little more serious about, <clears throat> about ads. And then when I went to uh, Spain for the 20 Books Mallorca um, mastermind group, I learned a lot about ads at that, and that helped me take it to the next level. Um, so you do a lot of, you do most, all, pretty much all that yourself, right? Yeah, I do it all myself. I do everything myself now. I, I, I do absolutely everything myself other than, um, I have a cover designer who does the covers. Um, you don't have an editor you work with that. I mean, how do you, how do you, you just do it all yourself, huh? I do the editing myself and the proofing myself now. Um, it's not perfect. My wife takes a pass at my books now, but I want to get them out fast. And I, I, I don't really, after 30 books, I kind of know how I want it to end up. And so I write good first drafts. I do four, four rounds of editing myself on it. Um, and then that's it. Gotcha. So I, so with, the, with this series, I've always used editors until this series and I stopped using editors and this is by far my most popular series, but I mean, so. I, 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 that's not advice I would give to a newer author after 30 books and, and after editing hundreds of other people's books and I take four passes at it. So not that they're perfect by any means, but they're pretty, they're pretty polished by the time they come out. I was going to say, you have to have a certain level of experience to be able to do that for yourself. I mean, I'm a freelance editor. That's my main, my gig that I make money off of. And, yeah. and I can say that even I, even I use editors on most of my stuff just because it's, it's, you need that perspective, but you know, once you've done it, you, you certainly, there are techniques you can use to help you do it yourself. And that's what you've learned it, obviously. Yeah. And also it's, um, so like, for example, when my fantasy book is done, I'll definitely use an outside editor on that with these mysteries they're sticking to a certain uh, structural layout that is almost a blueprint. So I, and I outline them to about 10,000 words of outline before I start writing them. So I know that the story works before I start outlining them, before I start yeah. writing them. Right. Uh, with, with a new project, a new genre or something, I wouldn't do it the same way at all. I, I'd well, yeah, because you need that. You need feedback to learn. Like when I switch genres, yeah. I'm always looking for somebody who can give me that perspective I don't have. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. So right now I, I do it all myself. Um, I did just hire someone who's running some aspects of my social media now and who's going to come on full time in January and she will take over uh, a lot of stuff, website, email, book formatting. She'll take over everything other than the writing and the ads. Basically, I'll give her the entire everything I do other than the writing and the ads. Cool. Um, starting in January. So that will be nice because I've been a little bit overwhelmed the last few months not having enough time to write and spending too much time on the business stuff. And I get you. Okay, guys, so this is the halfway point. Well, we're, we started a little late, but roughly you can start asking questions down in the comments if you want to related to writing, related to D.D. Black and his books, A.C. Fuller books, all that stuff, and uh, we will try to answer them in the meantime. Let's talk about audio. Now, you said your book's on audio. How did you get... How does that go? You uh, you do it all yourself. Do you do your own audio? No. So I, yeah, that I shouldn't have said I do it all myself. That um, so I I manage that, but I have a narrator whose name is Joe Hempel, and he's great. He was hired by um, I think it was Tanter or Findaway. Some when I was AC Fuller, some company that I worked with, they uh, bought the rights to one of my series, and they hired Joe to do it, and. Um, when I went indie a hundred percent and I, I wanted to keep the rights to my audio books, I called Joe and he said, yeah, I'll record them. And so, cause he does freelance recording and works for pr production companies. So he does them, I upload them and that's it. Um, I send him the finished book. He does everything else, sends me the files and then I upload them and it's been working really okay. well. He's working on book seven right now. So where, what market you sell, you upload them to, to Audible? Is that what you do? You upload them yeah, to Audible? I upload it through a platform called ACX and they, they land on yeah. Audible that way. Yeah. Gotcha. So are they, they're, are they, they're all available just as download. You don't have CDs or anything like that, right? 
No, I don't. They're just um, just audible right now. Eventually, maybe I'll take them. I mean, it's cool. I get it. Some people like that, though. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, no, I grew up listening to when we wanted to buy an audio book, we had to order the CD, usually from the Blackstone catalog. Sometimes it was even cassettes when I was a little younger. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Pay sometimes, you know, $110 for a really long audio book, and it was 25, 30 CDs. And, um, yeah, those were those were the good old days for audiobooks. I'm I'm glad we can get them for one credit for ten bucks now. Yeah, well, and they, and, you know, I've got one that's on. It's on both. It's available on the CD. There's also an MP3 version, which is 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 only two CDs, and and yeah. it shrunk, and it's got the digital download. I mean, that's just the way it is. But yeah, so the process that you found Joe Hempel through the through the other people that that were doing your books. That's cool. So he's has he done all your books or just the ones in this mystery series? He did uh, all the ones in this mystery series. He did all the ones in my old thriller series. My They're called the Alex Vane Media Thrillers. He did that. And then my other series is from a woman's point of view. And, and that one I sold to a different company. And they hired a different narrator for that. So he's gotcha. done quite a few of my books. And he's doing a great job. And I'm on my new series, he's actually going to partner. There's dual point of view. We're going to have a a woman narrate about three quarters of it. He's going to narrate about a quarter of it, but he's going to manage the process. He's a great uh, indie narrator. He does a lot of a lot of books in all different genres. Yeah, that's great. So, so the um, uh, the 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 you said the Alex Vane series. That was your thriller series. Tell us a little bit about Alex Vane for those who might be interested in that. Yeah, so that was uh, back when I was closer to my journalism career. I thought I would write a series of thrillers that I would call media thrillers, which are all centered around a journalist character and storylines that involved newspapers, television, magazines, the media world. So that was the theory behind that. So it's kind of like you would see, you know, you read a legal thriller by John Grisham or whatever. These are all thrillers set in the media. So he was a journalist, investigative reporter, and would be uncovering major crimes and conspiracies and getting all sorts of trouble. Um, so those were, you know, those were a little bit longer, a little less action, a little less murderous. Uh, the conspiracies were more political, financial in nature. They usually did involve some form of murder, but not, you know, evil serial killers, stuff like that. Murders yeah, yeah. to cover up, you know, weird corporate crimes and stuff like that. So, yeah, those ones did all right. They were they did well enough for me to leave my teaching job and, and write full time. Um, but they never they never quite took off and how many of those are there there's five of those yeah they runs from book one is the anonymous source up through book five the last journalist and then i ended that series and i did another series called the crime beat which did quite a bit better which is also journalist and cop kind of solving a big international thriller murder case um that one did fairly well and that one is still still out there um but yeah, then I then I switched genres in a little bit. Yeah, well, and so somebody asked somebody asked why you switched from thriller to mystery. I mean, are those series done? Are you going to ever write any more books of those, or they're done and you switched no, over? They're done. Um, they're done. AC Fuller is done. <laughs> he's he's retired. Um, okay. What made me switch? Um, well, those thrillers always had a strong mystery element to them, um, and Let's see. It's a, it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure why I switched. I think, uh, you know, I had a few friends who were writing more mainstream mysteries and doing really well with them. And I read a few of them and I'm like, yeah, these are really good. I kind of like these better than my books. Um, and so I thought, God, I could write those. Um, and I think at the same time, I was watching more p procedural type stuff on television. Like I was watching um, you know, Bosch on, on Amazon, which has is, is more of a, you know, police mystery. And I thought, eh, I'm just going to go with something like this. And I don't know. I don't really think too hard about these things. I just sort of, <laughs> that was my instinct and I just ran with it. Yeah, no, I get you. And that's fine. I mean, yeah. if you have good instincts, and obviously you did in this case. I mean, that's great, you know. So what, go ahead. Oh, no, that's. That, that was i'm just trying to think i'm trying to think through my thought process and it was like i gotcha. I, I can't really remember what my thought process was seemed like a good idea at the time my mom always said if she wrote an autobiography it would be called it seemed like a good idea at the time yeah 
There you go. There you go. That's part of uh, my philosophy. So this is Creator Talk Live. We are talking with author D.D. Black slash A.C. Fuller. Uh, and uh, I'm Brian Thomas Schmidt. You can follow us here. Obviously, like the talk, follow me, follow D.D. Black, uh, so you can see what he's got going on. You can find a link in my profile to my books, as well as to past episodes of Creator Talk Live. Again, we do this Monday through Friday, usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday will be the regular time. Uh, and I assume they can find your book link on your profile here? Yeah, on my profile, uh, the first, that link will take you to the first book in my in my DD Black series. Um, and yeah, it's right there in my bio. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. So uh, let's see. Um, so if you guys have questions, go ahead and ask them and we'll just keep going here. Um, again, you can also get to the replays, the third tab on my uh, top of the various episodes. I think this is episode six or seven at this point, something like that. Maybe eight. I don't remember. I lose track. Anyway, so uh, you, uh, you've you been doing these books for a while. You you want to do a little bit of fantasy um, tell us about you yourself. You're, 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 you're married with kids, as I understand, right? You're, you have kids. Um, my Corgi just ran through the dog door and just trying to get on, get in on this interview. So yeah, I've got two kids, <laughs> um, a Corgi who is featured in the books. And if anyone looks at my TikTok, they'll see multiple Corgi videos. That's Pearl. Um, yeah, I live out in the Pacific Northwest. I'm from California originally, lived in New York City, uh, taught at NYU in the journalism school there for a bit. And, um, now, you know, I'm pretty obsessive about writing. It's kind of all I do. It's either kid stuff, wife stuff, or writing, um, or, or all so, that goes with the writing. So let's talk about writing. What is your, what is your write, typical writing day look like? How do you, how do you structure your writing? Um, usually I go to bed very, very early, often by seven. I'm usually up by about two and in my office, um, usually writing 3 a.m., I'm actually writing, so I drink coffee for about an hour to wake up, and then writing by three, and then by six thirty, usually I'm done my writing. Um, my son wakes up then, get him ready for school, cook breakfast, make lunch, stuff like that, and then um, for the rest of the day, sometimes if I'm on a deadline, I'm editing or I'm rewriting, but often my writing is just from three to about six thirty in the morning, and that's it. And then the rest of the day, I'm doing all the stuff that goes with the writing, marketing, interviews, correspondence, emails, research, kind of just dinking around. I mean, for me, it's like I treat my morning writing kind of like, you know, an athlete would treat their game day. Like everything is geared toward that one three hour period in the day so I can make sure to get a good chunk of writing in. Um, so right early in the mornings. And then if I'm on a deadline, I'm often, it just gets earlier and earlier and then it turns into 10 hour editing days. But um, right now I'm, I'm not on a tight deadline. So just kind of relaxed, wake you up. Have a, do you have a word count goal that you set every day? Uh, usually, yeah. I mean, it's when I'm writing a new book, it's usually around 5,000 words in a day. Um, if I'm actively working on a book, I often don't hit that. Sometimes I hit more than that. Um, but that's working with an outline that is uh, excruciatingly detailed. So I'm not coming up with any story or research when I'm writing like that. Um, a lot of people write more than that, but most, most newer authors aren't really writing that much yet. But I'm writing from an outline that's super detailed. So I have all my locations, character names, the beats of the story, kind of the mood of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and I have that on my outline on one side of my screen and I have the blank page on the other side of the screen. So I'm kind of typing up a story that I've already lived through when I worked on my outline. Because when I work on my outline, I'm, I'm not hitting a word count. I'm really just trying to come up with a detailed chapter by chapter outline in the course of, that usually takes about one to two weeks to do the outline. I was gonna ask you that. So, okay, and what software do you use when you write? Are you just a word guy or do you use Scrivener? How do you, how, what's your, you I just know? I switched from Scrivener to Vellum. So I, I write in Vellum now. Uh, and it's, uh, which I switched to because it syncs better for me than Scrivener ever did. It's a, it's a lot simpler than Scrivener. It doesn't have as many options as Scrivener. Um, but for just getting the words down, I find it pretty useful. So I'll have a dual screen. I'll have the blank page on one side and my outline on the other side. And I'll just uh, go back and forth like that. 
Gotcha. Do you, so you do it all, but you do do it all by typing. You don't do any dictation or anything like that. Mostly I type. Sometimes I do dictate. I have I have a good uh, recorder on my computer, and sometimes there's scenes like a monologue, especially if I'm not going a bunch bunch of back and forth. If you know if one character is delivering a you know an impassioned two paragraph monologue, I might just speech to text that uh, yeah. because I find I can actually write it a little bit better. It'll take editing, of course. You know, it yeah. would definitely take a few passes. Uh, but sometimes I will do that, and I'm not one of those guys like my friend Nick, who teaches a class on on uh, speech to text, who can go back and forth really fast and and get forty thousand words in a day or whatever that way. Uh, I'm not that fast. That's crazy! Wow. <laughs> He's very fast, and it's uh. Yeah, I can't do it that fast. I just can't think through that much story at the same time, you know. Yeah, no, I got you. So, so you write it in vellum, and then and then it's already in vellum. So when you go to format it, you got to do all that. Do you ever do you, do you ever export it out of vellum for any purpose, or do you do your editing in vellum too? How do you do all that? Yeah, no, no, I uh, I I do it in vellum, and I, I rewrite it once in vellum, and then I put it in Google Docs, and in Google Docs, my wife will read it. She'll maybe make a few changes. Um, then I'll do a full line edit myself in Google Docs, and then I do my final edit in, um, I have Speechify, which is an AI reading program uh, made by a, a guy who wanted to make a reading program because he was dyslexic. So it, it hooks into Google Docs, it reads the program out loud to you, or the book out loud to you, and I watch it on my screen while listening to it, and I catch a lot of stuff that way. So I do a whole edit that way too which usually takes about 14 hours for a 60,000 word book. Yeah, and um, I was gonna ask you about that because reading it aloud is kind of an important part of the process for most of us. And yeah. so is, it, is the Speechify, is it a normal voice or is it kind of a computer voice? It's gotten really, really good. Um, yeah. it's, not, it's not as good as a narrator, right? I wouldn't use it to narrate a book that I would try to sell to anyone. So it's not that good, but it's quite good now. Um, and for me, what I'm looking for is some typo. So it, like a double word, you know, if you have a double word, the, the, it'll, you'll hear that you might, your eyes might scan over it, but you'll hear it. Um, so the narration is quite good. Sometimes I'll even listen to it in a, in a different accent. Um, cause I'll catch things that'll just make my mind think about something differently. Um, yeah. so the, the voices have recently gotten quite good in speechify. And yeah, it hooks into Google Docs and I'll stare it, I'll read it and listen at the same time. And I find that I, I just catch a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't catch. And I try to do it all in one day, that final edit. So that's like 14 hours or so, where I wanna experience the entire book in one day, which is how most of my readers read it. It comes out and then they read it all that day usually. Um, it's an intense day, but yeah, I get it. I mean, I. I, my most recent book was the first time I got an audiobook of a novel, and I listened to it on a drive to Denver, and it was so cool to experience the book that way, you know, and, and yeah. just hear the whole book back, and you realize, yeah, I'm better than I thought, or I'm worse than I. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. I found stuff. I found stuff. I was listening to the, you know, the they hadn't put it out yet, so I was like, oh, here's a few errors I found. Can we fix this? <laughs> yeah, that's the. What I don't like is listening to the audiobook after it comes out, because then it's like there's no fixing it. What I'm yeah, doing yeah. before it comes out, at least I can fix stuff. But yeah, it's I find that if I listen to an entire book, more like a reader would experience it, where they're not, where they're, uh, you know, getting it all in a day or two days, because these are fairly short books, uh, I can really experience the story and I can study it for continuity things and really make okay. sure, okay, does this piece in chapter 30 connect to the thing in chapter one in the way that I want it to? Whereas if I was doing it over a week or two with lots of interruptions, I might miss that kind of thing. Yeah, so. I mean, that's the thing. That's what I like. I mean, if you can it, you can step outside of it, you know, you're so close to it when you're reading it yourself. And uh, it's so easy for your mind to start getting jumbled with all the stuff you remember. I left this out or I made this decision or I did that. And, and you start losing the nuance of it. That's why it's so great to, to listen to it and read it at the same time. Because, again, like you said, you catch those missing words or duplicate words or even repetitive words, you know, those kind of things. And then you also can see how the logic flow worked out if it worked out the way you wanted it to, because you can pay enough attention. How do you edit your own stuff these days? Um, I mean, like, 
I know you probably have editors too, but like, how do you do your first pass after you write something? Uh, I take it out of Scrivener. Uh, I fr first draft is always in Scrivener because I love the way I can move everything around and hide secret r yeah. research and all that. And then I take it out into Word, and usually I run a, a spell check on it just to see what pops up, get an idea of what's there. Then I send it off to a friend of mine who's an editor who, who will go through it and make extensive what he calls suggestions. I consider them editorial notes, but we go back and forth a little bit on that. And then I go back through and do a pass. Um, sometimes on certain books, I go through and do uh, a polished pass before I send it to him. Usually I do. He usually gets the second draft because there's, there's things like description that I tend to be really sparse on the first draft. I'm just not as good with the description, and I need to go back and think about how to do it. Or I'll, I'll notice my character descriptions all have the same pattern. Oh, i got to fix that, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I go through that way, and then, yeah, then I have him work on it. Um, and then when it comes back from him, I either read it aloud or I have something read it aloud to me and do another pass. And occasionally I'll send it out to a couple of beta readers. Usually I have a couple proofers that I send it to and they read it and they know my stuff well. And that's usually my process to get it done. But yeah, I mean, I it, there are times when I hire an editor. I started doing some women's fiction and romance recently and I hired an editor for that because I don't know those genres near as well. So I wanted somebody who could go through that and kind of say, oh yeah, here's where you're, you need to work more on this, you need to work more on that. But for the most part, he, you know, with my thrillers, he's been with me through the whole series. So he tends to do that. And I don't know what I'm going to do with this mystery when it's done because it's, it's a different kind of thing for me. So it's the first straight non-sci-fi thing I've done. So we'll see what happens with that. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's my general process. And then, and then uh, um, pretty much I do it all in Word at that point. I even do book formatting in Word. Um, we have templates that we use. He usually does my book formatting, in fact, the editor. He's really good at it. And he's really good at the Widows and Orphans and all that. And he'll just... He'll just, we have templates, we pop it in, and he can get a book done in a, in a, in a couple days, get the thing up and going, and uh, then we just go through and look at what we need to clean up and all that kind of stuff, and and then we're we're good. So, I yeah, I can put, you know, you know, indie books, you know, man, you can put a book out for, you know, two, three hundred bucks max, depending on whether you do Ingram fees or not, and uh, yep. your cover cost, and then you can have it done, like I can have it up and mounted within a month easily or less, you know, up and up and out. Yep, I know. It's it's amazing. I mean, people people sometimes ask like how did I do seven eight books total in the 14 or 16 months since I created this pen name and um yeah, that once you once you're familiar with all the systems and, and also once you've got experience writing at fast, which I do and had planned it out, it's really it's really faster than ever. I know yeah. and I with me with cutting out pretty much every every person other than myself in the process that makes it a lot faster because i'm doing the formatting i'm doing almost everything myself and the cover designs i get well in advance so it's all pretty well fast. the easy way i mean the thing about working with i mean i i can't write that fast i mean i can it depending on how long the novel is i it usually takes me three months for about 120k book so so give or take uh three to four months for that uh and some of my books are shorter than that and so the 80 if i do an 80k romance it's going to be you know maybe two months or something but it, it it's faster but that includes the the time to go back through and polish and all that stuff um so you know i'm not quite that fast but yeah the hard the par hard part is when you work with these people if getting it on their schedule you have to really find people you can work with and that will put things aside and, and keep you moving if you want to move to get things out otherwise you're at you know you're in a queue for a long time that slows down everything yeah and that's back when i i had a, a couple letters and they were all good it just you know i was usually past deadlines and then i lost my spot in the queue and then they were annoyed and so this time i just decided I'm just going to see what happens if I just do everything myself. My wife, my wife does read all the books and she kind of makes sure I don't have anything too egregious in there in terms of the story. Uh, but yeah, she's had a few late nights because I'm always behind on a deadline and she, uh, she's retiring tomorrow is actually her last day of work. So uh, she'll be around to edit more for me starting soon. Oh, well, that's good. So you're both kind of going to be, you're, do you make enough from writing to support the family at this point? I guess you it sounds like you do. She's been a nurse for the last 15 years and we sort of both oh. provide some of the income. But yeah, no, this series has taken off to the extent where she's retiring and um, her first book came out um, about six months ago, actually. She's writing mysteries too. And I, you know, oh. I did all the production work on it and she wrote the book and uh, she wants to focus on her own writing more because with being a full-time hospice nurse, she didn't have nearly as much time as I did. 
Uh, so she's going to work on her own writing now. And she does a lot of uh, local marketing for my books too. They're in a lot of local stores and we do a lot of events and stuff. So she handles that and uh, is going to do even more of that starting literally 48 hours from now. We'll, we'll be having her retirement dinner. So now, does she, she come to 20 books with you? Yeah, she's going to be there. She'll be signing copies of her first book. She's a lot more outgoing than I am, too. She, I'm, I'm, I'm more introverted. She's she's way out there. She'll have a great time. She's going to the fantasy parties, all of it, you know. So yeah, she, yeah. you'll get to meet her. And, yeah, she's going to be writing mysteries. Her first book is called The Girl in Area One, and it's it's already out and doing fairly well. Um, but then she hasn't had time to finish the sequel because just work caught up with her. And, you know, it's, it's no, hard when you're working a, a tough job. She has to, well, she has to get in the groove. She's not in the groove yet. Once she yeah. retires, then she'll get a groove, and you never know. Maybe she'll be, she'll be like, hey, what's taking you so long? I've got 14 books already. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I, she says, she's announced confidently, five years from now, she's going to be the famous author, not me. And I'm <laughs> fine with that. I'm, she's been my editor. I'm, I'm her editor. Um, and uh, it's we're looking forward to it. It's a big change. You know, She's been gone for 40 hours a week for the last – decade or two and suddenly is going to be here all day every day with you know no responsibilities other than you know occasionally dropping off some signed books at a bookstore and and writing your own books it's going to be great um and so no what do your kids think of all this i mean i don't know how old they are but do they read your books do they have any interest in it yeah my so my daughter's 21 she's read all of the new series she listens to the audiobooks and she really likes them i mean they're they're fast paced they're fun um, so she's listened to all the new books, all the D.D. Black books. My son is 12. He hasn't read any of them. Uh, we mostly listen to audiobooks together, uh, fantasy mostly. Brandon Sanderson, Will White, people like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, yes, yeah, so he's not into these books yet. Um, but he, you know, he's, they're, they're, they're super happy that this series is doing well and um, uh, that, you know, my wife gets to leave her job and she'll be around more, so... Yeah, it's a, a lot of changes really fast coming up here. Pearl won't know what to do with herself. She'd be like, which which office do I go to, dad's or mom's? <laughs> She's used to me being the only one around during the day, you know, because, you know, mom leaves at 8.30 and comes back at 4.30. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so she's kind of, I'm kind of her guy all day. And now she's gonna be like, what is she doing here all day? Yeah. Um, but she's happy about it. She is in the books and is the star of my Facebook page. Um, the only semi-viral TikTok I ever had was about Pearl. Um, so it's, uh, she's already, you know, pretty much the most famous person in the family. So she's, uh, she may not know it, but pe the people who like these books like Pearl more than any of the other characters, I think. <laughs> so is Pearl, what role does Pearl play in the book? She's like well, the, she's the, the detective dog. dog. Uh, so yeah. in the book, her name is Run, but I say in the beginning, all the characters are made up other than run is based on our corgi pearl and it's you know her exact personality so um he she's just the the detective's dog and there's always scenes of him walking on the beach with his dog it's not the kind of mysteries where the dog can talk and solve the crime not not that kind of vibe um but uh she's just his companion and friend you know and that's it but she's very popular yeah yeah, yeah. well good everybody loves a good dog story yeah so i mean hey that they they really are. I mean, they they really are uh, a member of the family that 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 has a real connection. So I have two I have two, two dogs yeah. and two cats, and believe me, yeah. So that's great. So what is the? I mean, you're you're working on your fantasy series. Um, you have your own office, obviously. I can see that you've got what's what, you've got a ladder behind. Does that go up the attic? It goes up. There's like a little loft space. So this is our garage that we converted into a kind of a studio apartment slash office. So I'm in here. And when I'm on a deadline, I'm off sometimes sleeping on the couch. There's a little kitchenette over there. Up there is just like a little storage space. And um, yeah, usually it looks a little bit better because I'm on my computer and I have it set up at the right angle. So I didn't quite think this through, but that's... Uh, oh, it's fine. It, it, you look, it's fine. We've got you on screen and we can talk and we can hear you and everything looks great. So you can, next time you do it, if you want to play with it, you can, but it, it's right, fine. Yeah. So tell me who are some of the authors that inspire you? You obviously... If you write, you you have some time to read. You spend time with your son, listen to audiobooks. Who are yeah. who are your favorite authors? Who are the ones that kind of made you want to write, and who are the ones you listen to now? Yeah, I go through phases. You know, I I spent in the last five years, I've listened to a lot of epic fantasy and read a lot of epic fantasy. So nothing like 
my mysteries. You know, I really like uh, the Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin. I listen to a ton of Brandon Sanderson books with my son, which I appreciate they're not my personal favorites, but with him, you know, it's our thing that we do together. Um, let's see. Uh, I enjoy uh, the Patrick Rothfuss series, uh, the King Killer Chronicles. Um, but from the mystery standpoint, so I grew up reading stuff like, you know, as a teenager, like Michael Connolly, um, yeah. or Robert B. Parker, um, and, uh, J.A. Jantz and folks who write, you know, more police procedural and mysteries. Um, so, uh, I listened when I was a kid, I listened to a lot of Ken Follett with my mom. Those oh, are, yeah. um, he writes different genres, but so I listened to a bunch of his books, um, and then I like to read a lot of what would be called, you know, classics, you know, just. So do you actually read paper books or is most of this audio book? Mostly it's audio books now. I used to read only paperbacks and then occasionally listen to audio books with my mom. Now it's probably 90% audio books. Um, the unabridged audio book I find with my life is a good fit because I do a lot of driving, a lot of walking, a lot of stuff around the house. So I like to put in my headphones and, and listen to audio books a lot of the time. Oh, I got you. So you just do whatever you're doing while you've got them on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like I am i probably wouldn't have sat and read some of the series I've read on audiobook just because it would have, you know, the 200 hours of, of reading, I wouldn't probably have found the time. But the 200 hours of listening while driving, working out, doing dishes was more reasonable. I got you. I got you. So... Obviously, how many books do you have? Any a number of books planned for this series? You're just going to keep writing until you get. I mean, your other series ended. You said like five books, six books, something like that. Is this yeah. one going to keep going? Yeah, this one. Um, I mean, assuming people keep enjoying the books, I don't see any end to it in sight. I mean, it's it's our entire family income is off of these seven books in this series, and um, that's just going to keep going and going. I think, uh, you know, I am doing another series, but it's fairly similar, uh, that will run concurrently with it. I'll kind of alternate books for a while. Um, yeah. so I, I want to keep this series going a, a, for a long time. I mean, it, the readers tell me they will be very angry if I stop writing them. And so I don't plan on stopping writing them. I'm sure eventually it'll end, but not anytime soon. You don't want to be the victim in somebody else's murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that may be a good story idea, actually. Someone someone ends a series unresolved and then gets murdered. Yeah, um, That's actually not a bad storyline. I, I know there's, especially in the fantasy world, there's a couple big series that are unfinished, and there's a lot of angry fans about that. Um, I don't think it happens in the same way in the, in the mystery genre. People don't get as, as upset, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you've seen it. You've seen it played out in, in, in TV and movies on occasion where somebody gets upset about something. Oh, you killed that character. How could you? That kind of thing. But it's always an interesting angle. You know, I mean, I, I, I can imagine the somebody killing off the author and then saying, well, I got to write this series, but then have to deal with the fans. That, this isn't the same. What happened here? <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, think, yeah. I think I'll use that for a mystery a mystery novel uh, plot at some point. I think my readers would enjoy that. If someone turns up dead and it turns out they were an author who decided not to finish a popular series and leave a huge cliffhanger and then one of the fans killed them. There you go. There you go. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you got an idea out of our conversation. Well, other than that, where do people find you online? They they can find you obviously here at, at DD Black uh, signed copies on TikTok. Um, you've got... Uh, I know you've got your regular uh, Adam Fuller page. What, do you have a D.D. Black page on Facebook as well? Yeah, D.D. Black Author on Facebook. Um, D.D. Black Author dot com is where you can find all my books. And then if you just Google D.D. Black, uh, there's not a lot of us. So the whole first page is just links to Amazon or Goodreads or wherever you want to find books or links. Uh, Instagram, I'm on there. Gotcha. And, and speaking of which, not that, I mean... Obviously, his name is, you know, I, I assume it's not a secret. His name is Adam Fuller. Well, That's his real his real name. But D.D. Black, where'd you come up with that? Again, as lazy as the first thing I thought of. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, when I thought, you know, I wanted to do a new pen name, I, it was the first thing I thought of. I looked it up and knew, I saw there weren't any others out there. But, you know, so when I think about pen names, it's it's usually I want something that's going to be short so it'll fit on a, on a book cover well. 
Uh, you know, I don't want a 15 syllable name for a book cover. Uh, yeah. and it sounded like a pretty good mystery name. And, you know, I just sort of went with it. It was the first thing I thought of. Right. <laughs> and, you know, a few days later, I had the entire, this first seven books. I had, you know, rough outlines and I had covers made. And um, that was about 14 months ago now. Gotcha. And now what you mentioned your wife writes. What does your wife write under? So people, if people want to check her out as well. Uh, Eva Blue, E V A, Eva, and then Blue the Color. Yeah, there you go. So she's got a book out. What's the title of her first book again? It's called The Girl in Area One, and it's also a, a mystery set in Washington State, uh, fairly local to where we live, and and has some similarities to my books in terms of the structure and pacing and stuff. But uh, it's funnier. It's a little more comedic, a little more Janet Ivanovich in terms of the tone, uh, first person uh, from a nurse's perspective who works as a forensic nurse consultant with the Washington. Do you think you guys will ever do a crossover with your characters? That might be interesting. We have talked about it. Some people have brought it up. Um, you know, our main characters are both single and they're both in their 40s. People have, <laughs> have raised the question of romance. Um, I don't know yet. It's possible. Yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. We got to see, uh, you know, her whole life's about to change when she leaves her job after really working hard for a long time. So yeah. I don't want to put any pressure on her to, to write. If she wants to get back to her books, I think that'd be great. She's she's good at it, and um, she's going to entertain a lot of people. But uh, we're not putting any pressure on her yet. Yeah, no, you gotta. She gotta figure out her routine and get into it. I get that. All that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, hey, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for uh, being Great patient with the technical stuff and spending some time with us. For those again, um, please uh, like and follow our guest, DD Black Sign Books. You can check out his uh, his stuff. Again, he's got a, a tab just like I do at the top where you can go and check out the books in his series. And what's the character's name again? I forgot already. Thomas Austin. Thomas Austin. Okay, Thomas Austin yeah. mystery series about a uh, kind of a retired NYPD detective who's a consultant with a, uh, a Pacific Northwest um, police department solving murders, different crimes, and uh, you'll definitely want to check that out. These are these are like like one or two on number one or two on Amazon right now. They're they're really doing well, so they're obviously a, a very good series that people really enjoy. So be sure and check that out. Um, and uh, again, this is Creator Talk Live. You can go to my link, the Beacon link, and the third tab down, and you can get to the YouTube replays of all these episodes. I will put this one up here in the next couple days, and uh, you can check it all out. And also, if you're in the area of Vegas, you should come and see us both at the Rave, and as well, Adam's, his wife will be there as well. We're yeah. all going to be there, 300 authors, and it's it's, it's a, a lot free more event for you. What's that? She's a lot more entertaining than me, too. Well, She's there you more. go. But it's a, I should have her on at some point. But, oh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's basically uh, it's called Rave. It's at Horseshoe Casino and Resort on Friday the 10th of November, 10 to 4, free. Come in there, get signed books, get free giveaways, see readings, all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, we will uh, hopefully see you there. Thanks again for tuning in for us, for following and liking the program. And y'all have a great time. I'll be back on Wednesday with science fiction author David Acuff. See you then. Bye -bye.